And we are live. <laughs> this time we are live. I didn't pay attention and I was already starting to <laughs> introduce our amazing speaker <laughs> today on track one. Welcome, uh, whoever was in another track, uh, to the track one. Uh, again, I would like to thank <laughs> all the sponsors, uh, MongoDB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, Information Security, eLearn Security, Intel, and Remediant. I hope I, I said all their all their y'all's names right. <laughs> Thank you all so much for believing and investing on the event so it can happen year after year. That's very important. Uh, also on that note, don't forget to visit the Expo Hall. We have sponsors with contests and swag. So if you're missing the sponsors uh, swag on the events, that's your chance. Uh, there's also community organizations you really should find out more about and Red Team Village with five Red Team Talks going on. There are raffles happening, happening over there too throughout the event, so do not forget to check that out. About our talk today, so uh, the title of the talk today is A Human Thing, Strategies for Navigating Diversity and Inclusion in Your Organization. This will be a live talk with Keenan. It will also be recorded, so if you want to check it out later, it's going to be available. The Q&A are going to happen on the stage chat, so if you have any questions, please post that on the stage chat. I'm going to be right there with you. Uh, I'm going to collect your questions, and we're going to go through them uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, it's going to be around 40-minute talk and 10-minute Q&A, um, so just so y'all know, <laughs> if we have a lot of questions, I will have to filter them for our speaker. Uh, about Kina, she is CEO of Shift Ed, Inc. Uh, it's a security awareness company for all humans. Scali has 20 years experience providing security and management solutions, including personal, physical, cybersecurity, crisis management, and intelligence. In 2019, Scali was recognized as one of the top 25 women in cybersecurity by Cyber Defense Magazine. The software report as top 25 women leaders in cybersecurity and top female executives, Women World Awards. Wow. <laughs> Scali mentors and coaches for Cyber Patriot, Girls Who Code, and was awarded Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu Mentor of the Year. Wow. <laughs> well, it's the stage is all yours, Hina, and I hope you have a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, I'm just working out a real quick technical um, issue with the slides coming up. But give me just one moment. No problem. I'll be right here with you. Oh, I'm so sad. I had in this presentation a lot of the good jokes that everyone did yesterday. That would be such a great time to pass time, such a great way to pass time now. <laughs> Let me see if I can recover them. While we wait. Well, let's try this and then see if I can move from there. Are you guys seeing anything right now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so let me try this way. Can you now see my screen? Mm, it seems uh, seems it's a little bit frozen. Yeah, we we can see only a list of files. <laughs> no, okay. Hold on one second. No problem. Meanwhile, I am recovering all of my jokes from yesterday. Yay! Oh yeah, here comes the here comes the jokes. Are y'all ready? For some reason, it's not allowing me to share anything except for um, the backstage window. Maybe our 
tech team. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. Let me try that and then just open the other side here. Okay, you can see my screen now. Yes. And if I do this, can you still see my screen? Yes, yes we okay. can. <laughs> that was <Yay>! super fun. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, All just for right. everybody who's here, it's been, um, my morning has been a little bit hectic. Um, it, you guys are gonna notice some noise in the background. Um, apparently one of my fire alarms decided um, it needs a new battery, literally moments ago, and I didn't have time to, to turn it off. So you might hear something in the background. Um, but I'm super excited to be here. I love uh, the Diana Initiative and I love what kind of happening uh, with all of the talks and all of the uh, the backstage stuff. This has just been a great experience for me. So today we're gonna to talk about strategies for really navigating diversity and inclusion in your organization. Um, I like to say it's a human thing um, for pretty much everything that I'm involved with because I, I think that we've kind of gotten away from you know, the human element specifically in security. Um, and we tend to rely on a lot of uh, technologies. We tend to rely on a lot of things to help us get through life and help us get through security, but we often forget about the fact that it's really all about people. So what we're gonna talk about today is diversity and inclusion, number one, what is it? Uh, why is it important? some rising social tensions that um, may cause issues with diversity and inclusion and how organizations are dealing with that or not dealing with that. We're gonna talk about some metrics and some implementation features, a few company case studies, and then my favorite part of this are thoughts from the InfoSec community. So we're gonna have some um, really great ideas um, coming from some of my favorite people in InfoSec. So what is diversity and inclusion? Um, if you try to look up, you know, what is diversity and inclusion in terms of those two things together, you're going to find a lot of companies with their version of what that kind of means. But it's really important to go back and understand the, the definition of those individually. So um, thanks to uh, Webster, uh, we can see kind of um, the, uh, the definitions here. So for diversity, we show the condition of having or being composed of different elements especially the inclusion of different types of people. So it's interesting to me when I look at this that diversity, the very definition, has the word inclusion in it already. And then inclusion is really the act, the what you're going to do to make it so that those people can be included who have historically not been included. So it's kind of like these words were really meant to go together. And I think that that's really important to consider when you start thinking about DNI and how you want to implement that and what that means to you. Um, one of the, the talks we did yesterday, um, someone recommended that as you start an initiative, whether it's starting your own business, uh, whether it's starting anything, that whenever you get to a point where you kind of don't understand something or you're challenged by something, um, always go back to the very root of what it is you're trying to understand and what your original vision was. So when companies are first starting out or companies who are very successful want to begin implementing a DNI program, uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot, a lot of information out there and some companies are doing it very well and other companies aren't. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more too. So why is it really important that you have a DNI program? Um, first of all, it's kind of the right thing to do. And I, I, I say that kind of jokingly, but it, it sometimes, um, it's sometimes confusing to me that people don't think of it, that organizations don't think of it as quickly as maybe they should. Most of the companies that are out there today, I would say probably 80% of them don't have a, a DNI program. So this is really becoming a new thing where it's not a requirement, but it's something that you should have. And part of the reason for that is, uh, you know, some of these stats that we've got over here on uh, the this, this side, 85% of CEOs recently polled said that having a diversified and inclusive workplace population improved their bottom line. So if you're thinking why, why should I have a, a DNI program? Why should I start a DNI program? That's a pretty good reason. Um, if you're starting to see um, you know, people working better, people enjoying their jobs better, they're going to perform better. Um, another interesting fact is uh, by 2044, uh, 
most of the groups who are formerly or currently known as minorities will be in a majority status. So we have to start thinking of everybody as a global community of human beings rather than subsets of uh, human, uh, human beings. So um, what's really interesting also is that 86% um, of the next gen workforce of everybody who's coming from college right now, people who are coming out of maybe their first job or their first internship, they're looking for companies that have these programs. So if you don't, you're gonna start losing some talent and that's really important. Now, what's interesting, uh, there's a great study um, by the McKinsey Global Institute, and um, it talks about companies that have really great diverse programs and how they perform. So you can see at the bottom here, gender diverse companies uh, can perform up to 15% better. Ethnically diverse companies are likely to perform 35% better. Now imagine if you combined all of those <laughs> and suddenly you're looking at 45% better. So it's really important that you look at the entire population of not only your uh, employees, but also your customers and the people that you're trying to reach out to. If you don't have a very diverse workforce or diverse population, then um, how are you representing yourself to your or to your customers and to your potential clients? So some of the folks that I reached out to um, to kind of get their thoughts on DNI and how companies are starting to address this, uh, like I said before, some of my favorite people. Um, so Alyssa Miller had this to say. She said, I think companies that actually want to do this right understand that it starts with a culture of inclusivity from the very top down, accepting everyone as they are and celebrating our differences as good and a crucial element for success. Everyone has to be on board. When it's discovered that someone isn't acting in contrast or is acting in contrast to that, um, you know, decisive action has to be crucial. A single bad actor can still create significant issues within an organization that does a good job otherwise. So I really like this because it reminds me of the, the old uh, tech adage, um, you know, that you should fire the brilliant jerk. <laughs> right. So if you have that one employee who maybe is a rock star and the best at everything that they do, but they are promoting toxic behaviors in your organization, they're promoting um, a lack of inclusivity or, um, you know, really segregating folks in the company, then you fire the brilliant jerk because that's not going to help the overall company. And if DNI is something that you consider to be very important, then you really have to have everyone on board and you have to act swiftly when folks are not doing that. So I thought that was a great, uh, great piece of info there. Rising social tensions. So it's been a little bit crazy over the last couple of months. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening. Uh, we have a lot of politics that are happening right now on um, maybe some extreme kind of levels. Um, we're all being very affected by COVID-19. Uh, most, I think 88% of the global workforce is working from home now. That's an added stressor and social driver. Um, Black Lives Matter, the movement uh, over the last couple of months has really, really opened up in the United States and um, more people are becoming familiar with the problems that are associated with that. The same kind of things with um, LGBTQ uh, rights and trans rights. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of legal things that are going on, court cases that are going on. All of these things are happening constantly in the media and how companies react to these uh, is important because it demonstrates what kind of company you're trying to be. So in a, so a socially charged you know, moment, inclusivity is more important than ever, but not everybody reacts to that at all. And some people overreact to that, some companies overreact to that. So how do you find that kind of um, middle ground and make sure that it's right for you? Now, I noticed, um, during Black Lives Matter in particular, that a lot of companies were very, very widely different. There are folks that, um, I think I think it was Microsoft that actually um, kind of let go of all of their uh, social media and instead had um, African-Americans, Black people within Microsoft actually come out and uh, give their thoughts on the situation rather than trying to put a Microsoft spin on it, 
by just letting them talk about how it was affecting them and what they what they liked and what they thought needed to be done. And I thought that was very interesting and very, I think, good. I think the employees there probably felt more empowered by letting them do that. But there were other companies um, who would refuse to take a stance and just say, well, if we don't get involved, you know, this will kind of go away and we just won't have to deal with it. A lot of companies, and this is true for everything, not just you know uh, these particular issues, but a lot of companies go out of their way to not take political or social stances. And that's something that you absolutely can do. Um, however, when things start to get really hectic and in today's community of, or um, I would say hyper community of online uh, folks and being able to uh, see everything from their Twitter page to their website to the things that their CEOs say, um, you really are under a microscope, a microscope. So you have to take the opportunity to decide um, what kind of company you want to be. Do you want to be the kind of company that really digs in and says these things matter to us? DNI matters to us. We're going to use our platform to really push those things forward. Or are you going to stand back and say this isn't a topic that we should address? There are two very different ways to go for that. I know what mine is. It's definitely the first. <laughs> So some more thoughts from the InfoSec community. Um, Mary Galloway, one of my all other favorite people in the world, she said, right now, it's really hard to tell if initiatives are working at most companies because they just started looking at these things. I like that some companies have committees to help with understanding who um, who to build those types of DNI programs. This isn't really a company issue though, it's a people issue. Still a long way to go on changing behaviors and mindsets. And one thing that can be done better is taking an active stance and recruiting more diverse people and letting their voices be heard. Now this is a major issue. I think that most of us here at Diana are, it is very near and dear to our hearts is that diversity in hiring, but not just the hiring process. Once you get on board with a company, if you're not encouraging all of your employees to have that voice, if you're not encouraging them to be themselves, but rather trying to mold them into a community culture or a company culture that already exists, then you're losing the entire benefit of having that diverse workforce. It's really important that when you start thinking about DNI in your organization, that it doesn't stop with hiring. It has to be a holistic plan that covers everything from um, reviewing resumes and recruiting to hiring to onboarding to um, getting those people involved in big decisions about the company at all levels of the company. So just a quick case study, because I thought this was really interesting. Um, and I used Microsoft because traditionally, or I should say historically, Microsoft has been a very kind of white male dominated organization. And they've taken a lot of steps in the last couple of years to really um, drive that DNI initiative home. And they have a, a couple of updated reports in the last um, year or so where they're kind of demonstrating all the things that they're trying to do within the company to really promote DNI. One of them that I thought was really, really interesting is this idea of the inclusion index. So this is um, basically them talking to the employees, all of the employees, and having the employees tell them how they feel about working in the company when it comes to DNI. So do they feel included by managers? Do they feel included uh, in working groups? Are they asked their opinion? Um, are they comfortable going to their boss with issues, whether it's um, you know personal issues or work issues? Are they feeling safe? in their environment. And um, in this particular report, and all the sources are at the end, by the way, uh, in this particular report, it demonstrates that um, that um, most of the folks that work at Microsoft have some positive feedback for that. But what's also interesting about that um, is, is they still have a long way to go. So um, I think currently, I believe it's 27%, only 27% of Microsoft's workforce is um, female. So when you look at things like that, in contrast to some of the efforts that they're doing, excuse me, for um, DNI, every company I think has that benchmark of where they kind of started and where they want to be. And if you don't have that, you should probably work on it. And it's great to me to see companies at different level of those kind of implementation strategies. It's great to have a plan. Um, 
you know, that goes out five years, 10 years, but you also have to continually revise that and work through it, which is great to see from some of these larger and uh, kind of older tech companies. They also have um, some equal pay uh, data being expanded. So um, it, it kind of represents that 80% of their workforce um, is uh, getting a more nuanced understanding of pay practices. Now, a lot, there's a lot of feelings on this. There's a lot of feelings on equal pay and should you talk about pay and should you talk about this? Um, in my opinion, and I'm not, I'm certainly no expert, but in my opinion, you absolutely should talk about pay. Um, it's important for you to know that if you are a woman or a, a minority, that you are getting paid the same amount that uh, anybody else who's doing the same job is doing with the same background and the same skills. And if you're not, then, and you don't talk about it, then nobody can do anything about it. Right. So I think we get a lot of numbers, especially on equal pay data that don't necessarily reflect the reality. I think it's actually much worse because people don't talk about it. They don't talk about their salaries. They don't talk about their pay. And I think um, I think we need to get better at that. We need to get better at fighting for ourselves and advocating for ourselves. Some of the other things that they've done um, are kind of distinguishing, you know, their leadership before it was the just leadership and their distinguished uh, metrics for all of those folks in terms of DNI, so that they can look across the organization and see if they're, you know, if they're super heavy on uh, one race or if they're super heavy on uh, one gender, and then try to actually do something about that. So when we talk about metrics uh, a little bit later on, we're going to talk about how you can do that. Like, what are some of the strategies? strategies that you can take for that. Yeah. Metrics. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of really great information out there. And again, all of these sources are in the back, one of the back slides, but you can find um, all kinds of different ways to approach this. Uh, there are universities that have really great studies on uh, the effectiveness of programs over a long-term period versus you know, programs that may have kickstarted but kind of fail. And unfortunately, that seems to be more popular. Um, people like the idea and it looks great on paper and they have a policy, but they don't do all of the things that they need to do. They don't gather the data that they need to do to really make it last. So there's a couple of things that you can do um, to uh, gather indicators and metrics for the organization. Compliance is one of them. There are compliance regulations uh, put out um, by the government that, that go out to every single organization, every single company, and it lets you know exactly what you have to do, what you have to report, um, and how you have to do that. And if you're not doing that, if you're not kind of following those procedures, uh, then you, you really need to do that. Um, awareness, making sure that people actually understand that DNI is a big uh, deal for your organization, and making sure that there's an accessible um, amount of training or data or information out there for the entire company, not just HR, not just uh, you know one department, but everybody in the company understands exactly what that initiative is and what it does and how they can be a part of it. Talent integration, uh, again, the hiring process, you can't just um, get the person in the door. You really have to facilitate and nurture that person and that, that uh, person's sort of um, DNI pathway within the organization. And, you know, kind of self-check it in the, in the whole process. If you see uh, employees who are kind of stagnating, uh, maybe they're really great people and, you go back and start looking at your your metrics in your DNI space, and you're like, oh, okay, well, we apparently we don't we don't promote um, women, or we don't promote enough, um, you know, minorities. So that's something you have to think about. And then operationally, how is this going to integrate? How are you going to make sure that every person, all the way down to the lowest person in the company, and especially the mid-level kind of management, how are they going to operationally do this? What is it? Um, what tasks are they going to have to perform? What things are they going to have to demonstrate to the higher leadership to show that everybody in the company understands the DNI initiatives and that they're actually carrying them out? And then, of course, marketing integration, um, not just inside the company, but outside the company, making sure that everybody has a very good understanding of the type 
of company that you want to be and the type of employees that you want to have, people who are respectful, people who understand diversity and, and, and inclusion, and making sure that that message is sent out to the world so that your potential clients, your potential customers believe that this is something that is important to you and can uh, can readily see that, can readily find that information and uh, what you're doing. So how do you really get good metrics? This is a really tough one. Um, you know, metrics, you can measure anything, but when you start measuring what people like and don't like, it can be very subjective. So there's this great, um, and I think this one, I think this is the Forbes one, um, really great outline and I, I recommend you, uh, you read through it. But these steps are a good way to get you to start to understand what it is that you have to measure and kind of how to go from there. So number one, define which diversity dimensions you're gonna monitor. So what do you wanna look at? right? Do you want to look at race? Do you want to look at sex? Do you want to look at religion? Do you want to look at dot, 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 dot? And the answer should be all of those things. But, you know, some um, may or may not apply. And then once you have those, um, starting to review and create data policies about this. How uh, do you want to represent that data? How do you want that data to be protected? How do you how do you want to ensure that that data is not in any way a violation of privacy? Things of that nature. Selecting metrics for a variety of different purposes. Um, if you go into the article and you read, this is this is actually a really 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 great article. If you go in and read all of the metrics um, that you should have for each of these purposes, then it, you're going to you're gonna totally win. So one of them is definitely the metrics for um, kind of what Microsoft did with their inclusion index is actually talking to the employees, actually doing surveys, actually allowing them in a non, um, you know, attributable or non kind of, um, uh, I didn't think of the word, but uh, but so they know they're not going to get in trouble for being open about how they feel about these things. Because if you have a culture already that doesn't really support DNI, then it's likely that people aren't going to want to come forward and actually talk about um, what they think or what they've experienced. So you have to have metrics that allow for that to happen. You also have to have metrics about how those things kind of relate to retention. Um, do you have high turnover? Is it because maybe there are some issues here that aren't happening? Once you have some of these metrics decided, then it becomes a lot easier to kind of string these together to analyze and figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, and it talks about that here in a second. So um, setting targets and goals. Um, the Microsoft example, um, you know, again, they started out very early um, and they have a plan that goes out five to 10 years. Now, of course, not every company needs to go that far out, but having where you want to be tomorrow, where you are right now and where you were and being able to track that over time is absolutely critical. Assign responsibility and establish accountability. This is so important and it kind of goes back to what Alyssa was saying is that this does start from the top, but you have to walk the walk and talk the talk, right? So if um, if you start this program and then you never look at it again and you don't hold individuals accountable for their behavior, then it doesn't matter. It's literally just a piece of paper. And if you want your culture to change, if you want your culture to be you know, impacted by the benefits of diversity and inclusion, then you absolutely have to look at every situation and say, no, this is not okay. You didn't follow the policy. You're making people miserable, making people uncomfortable, um, and you're bringing a level of toxicity to the company that is just simply not needed. Tracking and analyzing the results. So once you have kind of exactly what it is that you wanna measure and how you're gonna measure it and you have your goal post and you have today and you have tomorrow, um, analyze regularly, follow it. It's not something that you create once and never look at again. It's something that you are continually refining and looking at. So that goes to the next one, reviewing the metrics regularly. You can't, um, you can't affect change if you don't know what's changing. So you have to just keep looking at it. You have to keep trying. And your demographics are gonna change. The people in your organization are gonna change.
So another one of my favorite human beings, Tyrone uh, Wilson, said that it's really simple if you want diversity in your company, then just make it happen. No more marketing gimmicks or campaigns because it only shows that diversity isn't a part of your brand at a subconscious level. Show us your C-suite, the advisory board, your recruiting team, the hiring managers, and anyone who's customer facing. Treat and present everyone as a human and not as proof of a successful diversity campaign. I cannot echo this statement enough. I see a lot of companies personally that are great at marketing their program, right? They have all the great posters. They have the, the best, most diverse group of people in every single one of their uh, presentations. And it's just, it's, it's amazing, right? Wow, they must be doing such a good job. And then you go there for a meeting and uh, you're the only woman in the room <laughs> or the building, or you're the only minority in the room or the building. So that just means that my, my respect for you as a potential um, client or as somebody that I will work with in the future or partner with in the future has kind of gone down a little bit because now I know that there's a lot of lip service there, that you're doing it for the point of showing people that you're doing it and not because you really believe in it. Implementation, oh gosh, this is also super, super important and kind of hits on some of the comments that we've had already. Lead from the top. Um, I know this from experience at uh, several places where, you know, really trying to implement this concept of, of DNI and and implement programs that allow the employees to really have input to really be able to shift the culture, to change the concepts about what the company should be in terms of how they take care of their employees. Um, but unless you're sitting at that, that head table, unless you're the CEO uh, or the board or you know folks in those category, then it's not gonna work unless those people are behind it. So this has to stop from, or has to start from the top. Rely on experience. There are so many folks out there now who are truly DNI experts who have been working on diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion for a very long time, and they know how to implement good programs. They know how to um, really be empathetic and understanding as to the kind of organization that you have. So, you know, seeing uh, the chief uh, DNI officer is uh, is becoming a very popular thing, and I think that's a great. Uh, a great step forward, but there are definitely other roles within the organization that can also help to promote diversity and inclusion. So find those people, hire them, make them a part of your team. Measuring employee attitudes. This, I, I talked about it a couple of times because I really believe it's the most important thing. If you don't know, then you don't know. <laughs> so Finding a good way to measure those attitudes, to measure how people feel about the company, how they feel about their ability to affect change when it comes to diversity and inclusion is super, super important. And like I said, it's not always easy because sometimes if an, a culture or an org organization is not um, very inclusive already, then a lot of people don't want to come forward. They don't want to uh, risk being judged or risk being fired because they've come forward. So you have to get creative in how you get that data from them. Training, 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 training. <laughs> All the training. Um, this isn't easy. This is not, as much as we think it should be common sense or that it should be um, something that everybody does, that you should just be empathetic and understanding and treat all humans like humans, um, that's simply not the case. And we know that. So if this is something that's important to your organization, that's important to the kind of culture and the kind of company that you want to have, then it's your responsibility to figure out how to make sure every single person in the organization knows what the expectations are when it comes to DNI. Um, and is told repeatedly. So whether it's quarterly events or, you know, hopefully not a, a PowerPoint presentation that you have to click through and answer questions because that's that's not the fun set. Um, but you have to do this regularly. You're always going to have new people coming on. You're going to have people moving around in the organization, moving up, becoming managers, leading people. Everyone has to be able to understand this in in an extremely detailed way. Create affinity groups. 
So this is where kind of the grassroots DNI comes in within an organization is being able to create uh, cross workforce groups that are allowed to or able or enabled to come together and talk about the things that they like or that they don't like and provide recommendations. And I think that you'll see a lot of times that once you start doing this with the affinity groups, you're gonna find out that it's not just one department that has these issues, that it's probably organization wide. But once you start allowing and uh, really promoting this idea that they can talk about it and um, you know come to the leadership with examples of, of other companies doing it better, other things that they'd like to see, then the entire company kind of takes ownership for that. Over communicate, over, over, over communicate. There should be no um, gray space about your policies. There should be no gray space about your metrics. There should be no gray space about anything that's a part of your DNI program. Um, you know, over communicating is, in my opinion, never a bad thing. But in this case, because of the importance of it and the importance of um, the human element and the human condition. If you are over communicating when it comes to DNI, then you're making everyone feel included about the topic, which is the first step, <laughs> literally the first step. Analyzing your demographics, you don't know what you don't know. So you got to get in there. You got to figure out who you have. You got to figure out where you're lacking and do your very best to not have uh, an entire uh, workforce that is one population or one gender or one um, race or one religion, because in addition to it just not being good for the organization in general, um, if you don't notice that or you're not paying attention to it, and on top of that, you're not really doing a DNI program, you're never going to really understand the benefits of having that diverse workforce. So this is something you have to do. And then walk the talk. Um, Again, this goes back to kind of what Tyrone was saying about the marketing folks. Um, you can tell companies pretty easily who are doing the lip service. Um, they have all of the great information out there. They're doing all of the wonderful uh, presentations, but then you go to Glassdoor and you look at what their employees say about them and it's brutal. So I would recommend to everyone actually going um, to Glassdoor and doing a search for the best loved companies or uh, companies with the best DNI or companies with, um, you know, really inclusive um, policies and procedures. And you'll find some really amazing ones out there. And you'll see the hundreds for some of these companies, hundreds of rave reviews that they get about what it's like to work in, a, in an organization that's inclusive. So walk, walk the walk, walk the talk. These are some of the sources that I have. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I keep trying to glance over there, but um, I know we have um, a, a Q and A. So if anybody has questions, I'm happy to happy to go. Hi there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did not have any questions so far in the state chat, but if y'all like to participate, this is the time. All the questions, bring them on. Uh, there's Joe who shared an experience he had uh, he said his most rewarding work experience were at a bank and later at Microsoft when he had a very strong mix of men and women of various social and cultural backgrounds. So if his team doesn't look, um, we are part of the module UN, then you are doing wrong. <laughs> That's actually great. <laughs> That's great. And, and sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? If you've been at an organization that isn't super diverse, you might not know any better. You might not realize it until you go to that first place and you're like, this is amazing. 
everybody here is so cool and from different places and different backgrounds. And it really makes working enjoyable on top of bringing all of those different ideas together to make the company better. Yes, there is a question for the inclusion index. Are there measures taken to address real lived trauma associated to sharing their experiences? Oof. That's actually a great question that I don't have the answer to. So um, unfortunately, with the report that they put out, uh, they don't include all of the metrics that they um, that they have there, at least not that I saw in the report. So um, I will try to find that information and see if I can um, post it in the, one of the back slides when we put everything in. All right, there is a new one now. How often do you hear non-people of color complain about uh, the recent diversity campaigns that are out there. Oh my God. <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just take that head on. It, yeah, absolutely. All the time. All the time. Um, you know, why is this such a big deal? Uh, it's been going on. This isn't a new issue. Well, yeah, no, it's not a new issue. That's part of the problem. <laughs> um, Sadly, and I, I, I think uh, I kind of touched on this earlier when I just said, you know, you don't know what you don't know. If you're in an organization that has never cared or never worried, or if you're in a population that doesn't have enough diverse people in it, then you're probably in that group of people that is trying to um, minimize or downplay the importance of DNI activities. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, we've got a long way to go a long way to go in terms of getting people to understand how important this is. Oh boy, yes we do. Uh, another question, are there uh, one or two of your references you would call out uh, that I can send to my CEO to get him fully bought in? Totally, absolutely. All right, are there good sources for how to write job advertisements that are more inclusive? Oh gosh, this is a whole other talk. <laughs> this is an entirely other talk that I could definitely do, but it's gonna, it's definitely a 45 minute thing. There are so many things that you can do, especially in InfoSec. You know, we joke about this all the time on Twitter and with some of our, our, uh, our groups is that, you know, the hiring, the resume, not the resumes, the request for a position when they come out, um, are ridiculous. I mean, they're just crazy ridiculous. It, anyway, you know, they want you to come in and be an intern, but you have to have eight years of experience and, 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 and all the certifications. So I think that's a bigger problem in that companies aren't good at writing recs uh, for what they're looking for. And a lot of times, and I really, I, I despise this practice, actually, people write or companies write recs for a specific person that they have in mind. And therefore, they immediately get rid of anything that opens it up to other people. And that's part of the problem too. Um, you know, hiring your friends, hiring people you know, that's a great thing. Sometimes you find great people, but um, if you're limiting the scope of your rec based on that, then you're not getting a diverse population in there. And then wording and phrasing is also very important. Um, I would also say that, you know, if you're, if you are an organization and you know what kind of organization you are, let's say you're a defense contractor versus um, somebody who, um, let's say, uh, somebody who owns an ice cream shop, <laughs> right? Know who your employees are, know who the people you're trying to reach are, um, and then open that wide up. So uh, like if you're a defense contractor, yeah, you could just keep hiring everybody from the military or you could hire some other people too to get different ideas in and different ways of thinking in to, to make your you know sort of defense process a lot um, more diverse. And we have our last question. Uh, how does diversity and loyalty seem to partner up in 2020? So I'm gonna ask you to clarify that question because when, excuse me, when I hear it, um, what I immediately think of is you're super loyal to your company, um, but they don't have any diversity and you don't want to stay there. Yeah, that does sound like, like that. 
Cynthia, In which case, if you could clarify us for your question, that would be great. And yeah, I just saw uh, Dave with that quote that you threw in the chat. If you only hire people you know, you'll never learn, do, make something new. I think this is this is a larger cultural issue well outside of you know just your company, but it's it's not really great if everybody that you know and all of your friends are exactly like you and think exactly like you. You have to have a diverse group of people around you both at work and in your personal life so that you can gain perspective and gain insight to everything else that's going on in the world. Or you can kind of stay in your bubble and um, you know, not really get that kind of um, understanding and broader understanding of the human condition. All right. Um, I know that we have a few more questions in the chat, but we're going uh, on our final 10 minutes. Um, let me just check on the backstage if we're good or if, if we already do the the change of the speakers. Yeah, we're good. We're good to change speakers. All right, uh, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Thank oh, you for your engagement. Um, one more thing, and I will actually um, I will drop it in the chat, the stage chat here. But for talking about this in the future and um, kind of community coming together and talking about practices that work and practices that don't, I started a Discord server that's called It's a Human Thing um, just for us to talk about this. So I'm going to drop that link uh, as soon as I get kicked off here, uh, right here in the stage chat. All right. Also, I'm leaving you all with the link to Keenan Servi as well. So feel free to give uh, give us feedback and give her a nice comment if you want. Um, and uh, also a little little announcement: uh, the ending keynote is going to be delayed uh, for th uh, around thirty minutes, uh, so we can have a nice you know paced uh, talk at the end of the event. And that's that's it. I would like to thank again our sponsors and everyone who engaged and participated. And thank you so much, Keenan, for your talk. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> Great. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. And thanks for having me.